past this old house, our experts travel across the country to answer questions about your house. Today, we'll tell you all about ground cover plants, show you how to patch any size hole in your wall, I love this, and install a new threshold for a problematic front door. On Ask This Old House. There's lots to love about ground cover plants. They're durable, easy to maintain, and add all kinds of interest to your garden. When it comes to ground covers, I think we all could get a little more creative instead of just using rocks or mulch. There are so many different plants that could take over the ground and help with erosion on slopes that you can't mow on or in little crevices where you just, you want a little green. So I'm gonna show you a few plants to use in these situations. A great option is the juniper procumbens nana, the Japanese garden juniper. Juniper is an extremely durable evergreen. It can grow over walls and rocks. It's deer tolerant, drought tolerant, and will grow together as a large dense mat as long as you don't cut it back. It's a full sun plant that can be grown in zones four to nine, which is pretty much everywhere in the continental United States. I like to use the Japanese Procumbens Nana in gardens that have more of an Asian theme, that have rocks, it's more peaceful, they creep and crawl and grow around. It's a very good architectural element. This is microbiota. A lot of people get it confused with juniper because it does have that evergreen foliage, but it's soft, feathery. This plant is rugged, it's drought tolerant. It does well in sun, partial shade, and shade. It only gets to be about a foot tall, so it's definitely another interesting option if you don't want to use juniper. And it's, I think it fits more in like a naturalized setting. So, highly recommended, love it. This is another commonly used plant called Pachysandra. It's an extremely low maintenance plant that thrives in shady areas and isn't too picky about soil quality. Aside from spreading quite rapidly, there's another little piece of interest that Pachysandra gives us. It has a little white inconspicuous flower, comes out in the springtime, just gives that little pop of white, which is amazing. But otherwise, it's a green field and covers the ground, which is the goal that we're going for. This is Sedum John Creech. It's another stone crop, and it grows to one to two inches high, this nice thick mat of succulent foliage. Uh, in the middle of the summer, it has this little pink flower. It's really cute, and it's another great ground cover option. I like to use Sedum John Creech in stone walls and little crevices of stone steps. It's a really great accent. It could take the heat of the stone. So, really great option. This is Liriope spicata, known as lily turf, and it's another fantastic soft ground cover. What it does is it has runners opposed to a clumping version, and it travels across and creates a dense, soft mat. This one is also Liriope spicata, but it's a variegated variety, adds a little color and pop in the landscape. Uh, it, that's the only difference. I like to use Liriope when I need a more naturalized setting, like under birch trees or under dogwoods. It just really puts a nice, calming, relaxing vibe in the garden space. Now those are just a few of the options available. I also like to use Irish moss, succulents, and even thyme. As long as it's not invasive and fills the area, I think you're good to go. So patching drywall, Tommy, something any homeowner is probably going to have to do sometime in their career. Absolutely. Somebody moving into a new old home, someone's hung pictures on the wall, they've got to patch a lot of holes. Are you selling a house? You've got to patch the holes from the pictures. This is a simple patch. I'm going to use some spackling compound. You can get it in all different size containers. But I don't have to do anything except push it into the hole, smooth it off, let it dry, 
and do a couple more coats later as necessary. As it dries, it shrinks a little bit, so that hole which is filled now is gonna look a little less filled after it dries. Right, exactly. And spackling compound doesn't shrink quite as much as joint compound can when you're doing uh, a spackle job like this. Right, okay, gotcha. All right, so a medium-sized hole. Now a medium-sized hole like this, this could be from near the baseboard like this, or it could be from a doorknob on the wall. And you could use some heavy duty joint compound tape like this or plaster tape and put it on the wall right over the hole like that. But for that, I would recommend multiple layers of tape. So you might put three heavy coats of tape. So this is the tape, uh, it's a mesh tape, and this is the tape that the installers use to tape the seams when they're putting it up on the wall for the first time. Yeah, it's a similar tape, that's a heavy duty. This, this is a little heavy. bit thicker. This yeah. is for patching. Yes, gotcha. exactly. Okay. All right, so now they also make a patch like this that like has an adhesive on the back. It's metal, comes in three or four different sizes. I've got a, like a medium size, and you notice that the t mesh is overlapping the joint. I can lay this on the wall like this. And it's gonna stick, stick to it. it. And I'm gonna just put, again, my layers of compound or spackle over it. Look at that. And so you mentioned spackling compound versus joint compound. The mm -hmm. joint compound is what the installers use to cover those seams when right. they're putting the board up for the exactly. first time. Do you care which one you use for which? Well, for this, I would use the spackling compound. And the difference between the spackling compound and the joint compound generally? Well, the spackling compound is a little bit thicker. Right. All right. I'm still going to have to. I tried to make it as smooth as I could on my first coat. I'll go over that again with another layer, keeping it smooth. And hopefully I can sand it after the second coat. But if not, I'll put a third coat, make it smooth, and then sand it again. Gotcha. Okay, so that's the medium size hole. You're using right. the uh, the pre-cut patches, and then you got a bigger hole like this. Right. Now, let's say something was made through that wall. What I like to do is cut a patch to go over the damaged section of the wall, which I did, and I cut out the damage, but I made this just a little bit smaller so I could fit it in there. So I love that trick, right? So we could have had like a round hole right here. Yeah. Rather than trying to get that precise patch, just cut a patch, trace yeah. it to the wall, and then make yeah. the hole bigger. Exactly. But you notice the problem with this is I have nothing to fasten it to. Right. So you'd have to put some something behind the wall. So I'd slide a board behind it, and I'd put a couple of screws in place. I love then that. I could, yeah, then take the center screw out, and, and then I could screw that to the wall. Cool. But they also make these clips now that you could actually put this in on all two sides or four sides, depending on the size that's needed. Mm -hmm. Put that in like that, and then you put your patch in that with a couple of little screws. Going to go through that flange behind there and there. Flatten out these spots here. And that's going to get flat enough that you're not going to see that? Yeah, you got to take your hammer and flatten them out. Gotcha. All right. Okay. But the other way is, is if you, you can take a piece of drywall like this, and I've cut it bigger than a hole, and I've removed the perimeter. I love this. So you actually cut the patch the size of this right here. Yep. But then you've got the paper. Right. So that's my tape. So now when I put this on the hole, and I made it a little bit small so I can get it in easy. See, it's got some play in it. Mm. But what I've done by doing that, I first have to put the glue or the compound on the wall first around the perimeter. And, and in this case, spackling compound okay for a hole this size? Yeah, I, wouldn't, I would go to a joint compound, anything bigger than this. Gotcha, okay. Right. So I put the, just a quick layer on here like that, take my patch, push it in. So that's gonna hold it in place. Right, now I just wanna push around the perimeter. Now I take my knife, stand it up. And you're pulling away from the seam right there. Exactly, scrape it right out. Look at that. And I will let that dry. That's my first coat. So that's gonna hold your patch in place. It's gonna set up, it's not going anywhere. Right, and I didn't have to do any tape and you're not gonna get any cracking. And you wait for that to set up before you put the top coats on? Exactly, try to keep it as smooth as you can on the first one. Then put your second one on. Again, try to keep it as smooth as you can. And then the third one, put it on and you may need to sand it. And if you do this well, your eye will never see this patch if it's sanded and feathered properly. You'll never see it. And like I say, and you not get any cracks. Beautiful. All right, Tommy, thank you. My pleasure. Mark, you are not the only guy who's got a monopoly on holes in your wall. Tommy Silva's patching drywall, yeah. and you were going to patch some brick holes. That's right. 
How do we get holes in brick? So actually it's pretty common. Uh, what about Christmas? Put lights up. Some people want to hang their stockings. Some people have signs on the exterior of a building. Uh, your federal, your state buildings have letters. All TV over the above buildings. your fireplace. All right, TV above you can your see fireplace. That. Sure. So we got to patch some holes. Yeah. What goes into it? All right. Couple different methods. There's two that I really, really like. One is out front right here, and basically all it is is matching your brick color, mm -hmm. okay, with one of these colors getting that, mixing it up, and applying it into a hole. And, and what are these? Is, uh, is this your typical mortar mix? This is just a mortar. We call this a mortar stick. Oh, okay, so and normally it would be the mortar that goes that's between right. the bricks. That's right. But we're going to get the same colors that we need out of this Look group. All of the samples. All so right. there's plenty to go. And then what are these? This is what we call a compound. And this is actually the list of colors that you have, so it's a little bit shorter than this. Hmm. But this, once it's mixed up, forms a putty, almost like a wood putty. And again, that would be applied directly into the hole and, and fill the hole. The reason we have so many different options is because, well, I mean, brick is a natural material, right? right? So we get variations, we get dark spots, light spots, but then also you're showing here different types of brick. Okay, so as we come over here to the wall, which we've got a patch right here, yep. How? what's the technique? Once we decide on a color, you've got, have you picked the color? By the I way? have picked the color, and again, I've picked that one, which again is going to be in that field so K10. that's a huge brick range right there no that's not too bad right it's not too bad it'll pick up a color somewhere in that wall which is what we want so we can continue the color range that's a putty and do you have a mortar that's sample a putty mortar sample I think that fits nicely but there are others that we could use as well all right so what is the technique once we've decided on the so color technique basically is to mix up either product the putty or the mortar and sand and just apply into the hole. Let's do it. All right. So I presume that the color match is actually a big part of this, getting it right. It's huge, but because this is such a difficult task, it's never gonna be perfect. So if I can't get as close as I would like, I do have other methods that are gonna bring, bring me closer to what I want. Which one are you gonna mix up for us, putty or mortar? I'll do both, um, but I'll start with the putty. Okay. So that comes to us, I mean, that's already got a color involved, so right. I'm, I'm buying that with the color mixed in. You are. So just add water. And again, when we're doing these small patches, everything is done by eye. There's really no perfect mixture of ingredients. I don't want to over pour the water. It's a golden rule with you guys, yeah. right? You can't take the water out. Because we always say that, right? You can't take the <laughs> water out. You've told me that a million right? times. A million times. But, but it can't be any more true, so that's why I keep repeating it. And something else I always repeat, Kevin, is neatness counts. If you're going to try to do this in a sloppy manner, it's just going to show and it's going to be there forever. So take your time. It's a small job. It's an easy job. But again, the artistic integrity that most Masons have within them always is going to shine through if they just give it the time. I saw that eye contact you made with you when you're talking about messy. I feel you, brother. I feel <laughs> no, you. no, no, okay. no. I'm going to leave it to you. All. Not at all. So that's the putty. So this is actually a very good consistency right here. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually like it a little bit drier than that for something this small, but so I'll let it set for a minute. Gotcha. Um, going to do the mortar mix just about the same way. This is my red, and I'll show it to you. But that's you, your dye. That's the dye, and that's that to me is a quintessential brick color. So I know I'm on the right path. Cayenne pepper. Yep. So you're mixing the dye into your basic mortar mix. I, exactly. It's a type N. Yeah. Where, where's a guy like me getting a bag of uh, dye like that? Am I finding it at the home center, or am I calling you for the secret code down at the brickyard? Yeah, you're gonna have to go to the brickyard for this type of thing. So I'll get rid of my spoon. I'm gonna add a bit. Don't add too much water. Not you too can't much. Take it out. Not too much. Another thing you want to be cautious of is a thorough mix. If you don't mix this stuff over and over and over, the dye clumps up and you'll get a heavier set in certain locations. So, what is the process for putting it in the hole? Believe it or not, well, obviously, if I try to poke into this hole with my margin trowel, it's going to be superficial. I'm not going to be able to get that as deep as the hole. So what I did 
when nobody was looking, I went into Tommy's tool bag and I got a little Allen wrench. He deserves that? Yeah. He's been going well, to my bag for years. And, and I tell you, I can't even tell you how many wheelbarrows he has in mine. There's like four or five. I'll apply on the back of my trowel and I'll just poke this through until I actually get over flushed. I want to come beyond the brick face and I'll show you why in a second. All right, well, let's see it. Let's right. see this go in. That's a pretty good match okay, mark. Because so that brick got wet, yeah, that's almost that's dead so, nuts. So that's what I'm talking about. That right there looks like I want to give it a little rub. So which not, I not did. a smooth pull, just a little rub. Just a little bit because again, I don't want to pull this material all over my brick. I want to be as inconspicuous as possible at all times when I'm doing this, which again is why neatness, neatness is paramount. But even then, I had a little bit too much water. But, oh yeah. Okay, so when I dab like that and I pull that aggregate that's in my mix, I pull that out a little bit, that's gonna mimic this surface Beautiful. when I'm dried up. Yep. All right, well, it looks darn good to me right there. So Mark, far, so. that's great. All right, appreciate it. All right, thanks Kevin. for the tip. You got it. Hey, Andrew. Hey Nathan, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Beautiful house you have here. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've been here for about three years now and you know we're slowly making improvements as time allows, uh, little projects here and there. But unfortunately, we have one that really has us stumped. We have a bit of a threshold problem. Let's go take a look. All right, see if we can fix this thing. Great. So here's the uh, threshold I was telling you about, Nathan. Okay, yeah. As you can see, we got uh, new hardwood floors installed when we moved into the house, which we really love, but unfortunately, it left us with a little bit of a dilemma here. Yeah, you can see this is a little bit of a quirky transition here. The flooring's a little bit higher than we want to see. Usually, we like to have it flush or below the threshold. I'm imagining you close the door, and yeah, you got a sizable gap below it. You know, quick fix is you could just do an applied sweep to that, and it would kind of seal that gap. But I think we could definitely ease this transition a little bit with some red oak, make it look a little better. Yeah, because the other thing too, Nathan, we do want to be able to put a rug on the hardwood floor for when you enter through the front door. Okay. Uh, is that something we could do as well? Yeah, while we're here, I can, I can undercut this door a little bit. I can build the threshold up to ease that transition, and then I can do an applied sweep that'll actually spring up when the door opens. It'll clear the rug, and when you close it, it'll drop right down. That sounds great. I'll get some tools out of my truck and we'll get started. Awesome. So what I picked up for you is just some three quarter inch red oak and it'll blend right in with your floor and once we make this threshold piece and I have a little mock up of what I'd like to do. Just mm -hmm. take the oak, wrap it out the back, do a light chamfer on the front and back and that'll saddle and that'll help kill the bevel here but also build up this threshold. Sounds good. All right, so we're applying three quarter inch stock and we're mm -hmm. building it up and I'd like about an eighth inch gap underneath the door. So I'm going to set my scribes to seven eighths of an inch. shut the door, and then I'm gonna mark the right side and the left side, and then we'll just connect the dots with the track saw. Okay. All right, now we can take the door off, okay. set it on the horses and cut it. Just a couple of pins to pull this door. Because of the fresh cut on the bottom, we exposed a lot of grain. We don't want that to wick up any moisture, so I'll spray the bottom with the sealant. While the door dries, I can work on building up this threshold. I'll cut the width from casing to casing on the miter box, and that'll get us started. All right, so for the piece that we're gonna to attach to the top of this existing threshold, for my width, I'm gonna pull from the edge of my casing back, because I wanna come around and kill this area but I need the full thickness of that three quarters, so I'm gonna to have to stop it at the leading edge where it starts to bevel away. So if I pull a measurement there, inch and seven eighths, we'll rip that on the table saw. To make the transition smoother, I'm gonna ease the edges with my table saw.
I'll cut a rabbit into the backside to help hide the edge of that beveled flooring. All right, now that we have the piece roughed out, we gotta fine tune it just a little bit more to get that exact fit. And the easiest way to get that is to put the piece right in place. Mm -hmm. Make a small mark here. Then lay it flat. Make a small mark there. Okay, then we'll cut that up. It's a small bead of construction adhesive for it to bed into. I laid out three holes already. I did one three inches in from the end on either side and then one dead center. So what we'll do is we'll pre-drill through the threshold down below and then we'll, we're just going to hand nail it. Now we're ready to apply this door stop to the base of your door. It's going to be the finishing touch. There's some really expensive ones out there and there's some really cheap ones, but the reason I chose this one is it has a little bit of a spring load to it. And you can see when I hold it down, see how that, that flips up? Mm -hmm. So this will be applied to the door. And when you open this door, this will spring up, clear the carpet, but when you close it, it'll push it right down. Oh, okay, that sounds great. All right, test it out and tell me what you think. Wow, close this tight. Room for a rug, and that threshold looks great. Thanks, Nathan. Enjoy. Next time on Ask This Old House, we'll demonstrate different ways to remove dry paint from your paintbrushes. Get a little dip. Get a little dip. Oh yeah, it's coming off show you how to install tongue and groove flooring all I do is pack it and we'll build a backyard ice skating rink that's next time on ask this old house